Willkommen auf der Siebes virtuell. Hau rein. Na, ich hoffe, aus dem guten Brandenburg habe ich nicht zu viel Package los. Ähm, wie ihr alle wahrscheinlich auch oder die meisten von euch bin ich äh, in meinem Homeoffice gefangen und äh, möchte heute ein bisschen über Home-Automatisierung erzählen. Äh, angefangen vom Einsteiger-Level bis hin äh, für die Hardcore-Nerds, die deutlich tiefer und deutlich mehr damit machen wollen als die, die, die Standardanwender. Und dazu habe ich euch heute einen kleinen Mini-Talk plus im Anschluss noch einen Workshop vorbereitet, den ich gerne mit euch machen würde. Eingetragen war das alles jetzt leider auf Englisch, obwohl ich es auf Deutsch machen wollte. Ähm, ich würde mich jetzt in, in Englisch durchstolpern. Ich hoffe, das ist okay. Um, and so we are starting uh, to switch into the English language and I start to present my slides. Afterwards, uh, uh, after the slides, we will go into a little workshop and hands on with you together, hopefully. Yeah, and uh, let's have some fun on the devices. So. Some things about me. My name is Andre Helwig and my name is Teko. I was born in the 80s in the heart of Berlin and I'm a member of the Seabay since 2001 and since a couple of years also on the board of the Seabay. Yeah, uh, I'm working as a system and cloud engineer, so this means I have very many things to do with automations and um, home automation is my personal favor here. Yeah, I'm an ethical hacker who breaks only his own things. Uh, I don't do any really bad shit, uh, only uh, an accident. Um, yeah, I, I started back in 2014 with just quite simple things like uh, turning my digital light bulbs on and off and changing the color. So this was quite simple in the beginning, but later I started to do more things away from the vendor applications. And I would like to enable you today to do the same. So what to expect? Um, First of all, I started with this around 30 minutes intro about home automation in general, some hardware aspects, some software aspects. Um, I would like to do some uh, definitions and wording because this can be getting very confusing later. And after this uh, small talk, we will have uh, hands-on. Hopefully, we have one and a half hour or more um, around uh, by installing some software, um, we will integrate together. If you already have existing hardware that is capable to be integrated, we can do this. Or if you don't have any hardware yet, don't be sad. We can fake them or find other interesting digital stuff that we can integrate into your home automation. And yeah, we will for sure chat about automation in general, share our experience, and help each other. So smart what? What means smart or what people think is smart uh, is a really huge gap usually. Because people think it's not a big thing, most stuff is plug and play and everything work well. Everything you need, you can get from a single vendor. But this is not true. We are far away from this. If you really want to get things smart, you have to do uh, tons of, uh, you have to choose different vendors, and we have tons of them. Everyone have uh, another kind of implementation somehow. Um, some of them are also locked into the cloud, so then you have to free the firmware somehow or free your device uh, from this evil firmware that by default connects to the Neuland. And yeah, for sure you have in incompatibilities between different vendors and they don't like it if you integrate stuff from other vendors into their solutions. Um, that makes everything more complicated than it should be. So yeah, how to start? Usually People get started quite easy and simple as I started uh, with some simple light bulbs. These Philips Hue are very common or Osram Lightify. Um, yeah, 
And in the beginning, it's okay for them if, if they only do controlling the lights or they want to see the status means in the beginning, it's okay for you if you turn on your lights, changing the color or see from remote if it's on or off. Um, when you leave the house quickly and on the way to somewhere and can take a look on your mobile to see if you forgot to change some lights off or I don't know what, this is for the beginning quite simple and you can start very easily with this. Um, so what you, what you get out of the box in the beginning from the vendors directly. I'm staying at these light bulbs because this is the most easy example to show you um, what, what the vendors does or what the vendors give you and yeah, an easy way to, to get started somewhere. Later, we will try to find some, some more interesting examples, um, but these are reserved for the workshop. So if you want to get in touch and talk about more specific things like or sensors, uh, etc. This will be done later. Um, in the morning, you wake up. It's quite nice if you say, I want to wake up at six o'clock. So start putting the lights 10%. And then very So before um Okay, Teko, du hast massive Bandbreitenprobleme anscheinend. Der Sound ist hier sehr, sehr schlecht gerade. Man versteht es wirklich nicht. Ähm, ich würde sagen, du guckst mal kurz in deine Soundeinstellung oder sagst den Kindern, dass sie aufhören sollen zu spielen. Und dann... Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's the next thing that's live, and the bandwidth from Tico is another somewhere, I don't know. Um, yeah, what we should do now? Um, I think the talk is good, and we will we'll just wait a few seconds or a minute um, so that we can start again, maybe. Yes, uh, I can see a T for Tico, and hopefully it will be going better now. What happened?
Can we continue? Is it better now? Check, check. Ja, okay. Okay, ab wann war das abgehackt ungefähr? Ja, ja. ja auch. Danke. Yes, so take a deep breath, keep calm, and here we go again. So most of the things are not really smart out of the box, except from kinds like uh, wake up scenes when you want to wake up um, by light uh, over a specific amount of time, means when you want to wake up at around six, just uh, configure your light that it starts increasing the percent of lightage uh, over a couple of time and said, yeah, when you wake up at six, 10 minutes before six, it starts to increasing the lights uh, 10% per minute. And after 10 minutes, uh, the light is on 100% and you have a very smooth wake up. This is nice, but that's not what I understand of smart things, this is just yeah, dimming or increasing the light over a specific amount of time. Another thing that came out of the box um, is a delayed shutoff timer. If you go to bed or something like that, and you are away, far away from your digital switch, just push the button, say it shut down in 10 minutes, and after 10 minutes, the light goes off. Um, Another thing that come out of the box if there is supported hardware is uh, turning lights on and off by movements detected. Um, in general, you have just the movement sensor and this movement sensor triggers the light to get on. And after a couple of minutes, uh, when no movement was detected, it turns off again. This is quite nice. Um, when you go through a room where you're just yeah, passing by, and you want to enable the lights without touching anything. This is uh, fully automated. This is nice. This is kind of smart, or what I think what could be smart. Um, but uh, the problem is this only works with supported hardware when you stick on a vendor. So usually some vendors don't have uh, movement detectors. Uh, Others have them, but they are quite expensive. So what is on my personal wish list to have things more smart um, is to combine way more things than just a light with a movement sensor. Uh, for example, um, I have a window open detect detection, so I can detect if a window is open or not. And if a window is open more than 15 minutes, uh, because this is way enough to get fresh air into the room, um, then start blinking indicator in the living room, for example, to notify me that I should close this window or send me a message to my mobile over, I don't know, Telegram, push message, whatever, you name it. And uh, I would like to know that I have to close the window. Yeah, you can, or I would like to implement also uh, unsupported hardware. Um, I would like to combine lights with movement sensors uh, that I built myself, because usually you can get this developer board with a wireless chip on it, putting a movement sensor on it, and just use this for your movement detection, and you can save a lot of money instead of buying uh, very expensive things from the vendor itself. But 
This won't happen the easy way because you stay in the vendor login and the vendor don't, don't want you to use other things. Um, so all in all, is this an easy piece of cake? Yes, but no. I would say it depends on or um, depends on what you really want to do. If you, if you have some simple things that you want to do, you usually can do this out of the box with vendors. But when you want to like uh, to have more advanced tasks when combining things from different, different vendors or building your own sensors or actors or whatever, um, you can't do this the easy way usually. Um, yeah, combination with other devices uh, is not possible the easy way or not with that what, what you get shipped by the vendors. So we need to close the gap by ourselves. We will do this later. So for now, we will talk a bit about sensors, actors, what the fuck. And um, yeah, sensors, I, I gave you some, some example already. We have, um, for example, movement sensors. We can measure temperatures. We can measure the light and looks. Um, yeah, anything that can be interesting for you can be measured. Um, for example, the actual Bitcoin price. Uh, for some people, I heard it's quite interesting to know the actual Bitcoin price. And yeah, with a smart home automation, you can also send notifications to your TV or whatever um, to give you an information about the actual Bitcoin price. Yeah, CPU load of a host is just an example to show you what you can use as a sensor because you can query um, every web page, you can send shell commands, whatever you want as a sensor, and the result of it can be used uh, later for other things. And uh, we mostly talk about Home Assistant today. Later, I will present you some, some other alternates or what I what I've seen in the past, but don't like to use. Um, and that's why I linked here the Home Assistant integration uh, of the available sensors that came out of the box. If you go there, have a look, you will find a lot of sensors that you can use, um, even things like yeah, um, sensor type REST, where you can send REST API calls to whatever you named. So these are sensors. Um, you also have actors. Actors um, usually just simple relays means um, when you want to start a heating pump. Yeah, temperature is too low. Start heating pump or start heating whatever. This is your actor. You can also um, switch um, power socket. Um, shutter actors are. Um, a bit more specific, specific than just switching on and off, um, because usually you, when you close a shutter, you need the power for a specific amount of time. Um, means shutter actor is a bit more than just switching because it's switching over a time span. And yeah, usually actors are everything that can be switched somehow. Um, Next thing would be automations. Automations, um, yeah, if a sensor has a specific state, do something. This is um, quite easy. If you push the button, turn the light on. This is the most simple automation you can have, but for sure you can extend these automations far, far, far beyond that. Um, another thing, yeah, when pushing button, like goes on. The example from before, if a Bitcoin price is over 90,000, send a message and let all lights in the house blink like insane. Um, because you can do a party or I don't know. And these are things you can do with automations. So now we will have a short look about types of hardware you will find on your way. And I will give some no, not not re not really recommendations, but what I've used in the past and 
for sure there are always way more examples than just the shown one. Um, yeah, in general, you have lights for sure. As I told you, the, the, the most common are uh, Philips Hue or Osram Lightify. And the less expensive version is a thing like Lum Luminea. Um, but you need to know that some of them are working on uh, Zigbee standard and maybe needs an own bridge or something like that. And others are just uh, uh, with these... Um, ESP with these small ESP chips on it to be able to use Wi-Fi. Yeah? And then you can simply connect it to your Wi-Fi and it's a client in your Wi-Fi. And for sure, if you have a look at AliExpress, you will find many, many more uh, vendors. But in general, you have usually Zigbee in it or Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. That's it. Yeah, another thing that you for sure will be neat is uh, switches. For switches, you can have, again, you, you have uh, uh, nice switches that you can uh, uh, put on a plate on the wall or on a magnetic, uh, um, on, on some, you can put it on metal and it keeps there or you move around and just use it like a remote. Um, Xiaomi also has um, switches. Same for Zonov and Shelly. These are used, yeah, if you if you have a uh, uh, voltage that you want to switch or a power plug, um, you can control these by Zonov or Shelly's. And for sure, there are also many other switches available. Um, heating control. Heating control is um, quite interesting if you have a house. But if you live in a flat, this can also be nice to heat up uh, your bathroom or something like that. Yeah, in the morning, if you don't like it too cold in there, just two or three hours before you wake up, start increasing the temperature um, by your automation. This can be done um, home automatic, is used for underfloor heating mainly. Atado and AVM are um, for this uh, generic heater that, that's put to the wall and can be controlled by turning the vessels off and on. Yeah, in general, you can connect any device that can be connected somehow. Yeah, by Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, Zigbee, and some some other standards. But these are the most common things that you that you connect. Yeah, on the vendor side, it's it's a bit sad. You for for every from every vendor, you get different applications, and you can't combine them together. As I told you before, this is quite pain in the ass, and I don't like it. I like it on a single single page and have a general overview about everything. Without yeah, usually, if you if you want to, if if you have lights, yeah, and you have two lights from different vendors that are not compatible to each other, and you have two of them in a single room, and you want to activate both at the same time. This is only possible if you open app one, say light on, going to the second app, turn light on, and yeah, I, I think nobody wants to do this, or the other way is stick at a single vendor, but this is most of the time not the case. Um, yeah, usually the, the, the source code of the vendor is closed, so um, I'm very happy if there is a custom firmware built by uh, hardcore nerds who yeah, generate new, new possibilities to the same hardware that the vendor wasn't able, able to um, send to the customer. Yeah, some also have XML and REST APIs, um, but mostly they are just reverse engineered somehow and not really well documented, uh, documented online. So what we need to close the missing gap, we need to put, put some glue in between. And this glue is called generally Smart Hub, and there are some solutions for it that I would like to show you right now. So the first thing that you maybe already heard of and the most people who looking into home automation finds it 
or if you if you have it in mind for a longer time, um, I'm sure you already struggled about it. The first thing is F H E M. Uh, in German, it is Freundliche Hausautomation und Energiemessung. And in English, it is Friendly Home Automation and Energy Measurement. This was developed in 2005 and written in Perl. Um, but I have to say, Perl isn't my personal preference. Um, you can do very much things with it. it it's quite lightweight it would be run on a raspy but yeah i don't really like to do everything in Perl. if you have affinity to Perl, you can use it for sure it's nice there are a lot of things but you have to do very many things manually and yeah if you have something more exotic you always have to yeah write your own code another thing that exists is um open hub um, it was developed in 2010 and is written in Java. I don't know what you think about Java, but I think Java is just a huge mess. And my personal preference is always to have it as small as possible, and it should be fit on a Raspi or some small device. Yeah, For OpenHub, this is not possible to have it run on such a lightweight device. Here we go. In 2013, um, Home Assistant was developed and written in Python. And this is my personal favorite. I will show you in a second how, uh, why. Um, another thing is IO Broker. Um, this was developed in 2014 and is written in JavaScript, so it's mostly Node.js applications somehow. Um, but to be honest, I haven't tested it yet, um, so I have no real experience with IO Broker, just uh, uh, read some, some stuff. And I don't really like JavaScript at all, so this is a no-go for me personal, and I like it way more in the Python world. So my personal decision was, in this case, Home Assistant. I started with um, FHEM in the beginning and had a very, very, very short look into OpenHub uh, in between. But um, since a couple of years, for three years now, I'm using, no, two years now, I'm, I'm using Home Assistant and started quite, quite simple. Yeah, it, and there are some, some reasons why. Um, first of all, it's it's slim or lightweight enough to be run on a Raspberry Pi, starting from version 3B+, plus, I guess. Um, it has a focus on security. Um, it ha has the focus to keep your data at home, yeah, because you don't want to publish all your home automations to the interwebs, because, um, yeah... I want to free the devices from the clouds, uh, not to give it back to the cloud. Um, I would like to have it at home. Yeah, it's pure open source, written in Python, as I told you before, and uses the YAML syntax for configuration. And because I use it at work, it's a personal plus. I have to do it. Uh, I have to work with it every day, and I really like, I really much like the way of. Yeah, configuring things in Home Assistant, and that's why I use it. Yeah, it's very easy to start with. So in the beginning, you, you can get a home automation system quite fast. But later, if you want to get way more in detail, um, you, can, you can also get way much deeper and develop your custom integrations or whatever you want. But these are the same things you could do with FHEM for sure as well. Yeah, If you want to write your own stuff, you could do this with them as well. But Home Assistant, I think, is the, yeah, in the middle of everything. Yeah, It's easy to start, but good enough to get way, way deeper. Um, they have really fast development and release cycles, have a very, very active community. Um, and I ne never had any problems uh, with, with updates in the past. So the good things about Home Assistant, it's very, very easy to start. It is 
the documentation is awesome. So for every module you find a good uh, good um, overview page where you find uh, examples for configurations. And if you have to keep something in mind, uh, this is also noted on the documentation page. It has a really nice performance. Mm, depending on uh, uh, some, some things I will talk a bit later about. Um, they continuously improving the user interface. One year ago, I guess uh, there was a huge update for the Lovelace uh, uh, interface to be more drag and droppable for beginners um, that they are able to configure everything. Um, the nice thing on Home Assistant as well is that you can configure things on the uh, graphical user interface as well as in your configuration files by YAML. Yeah, it's very easy to maintain. If you need to do updates, uh, you get notifications. Um, you can do the updates by simply clicking on your web interface on updates. And in the last two years, I didn't have any issues with it. Yeah, I also had to migrate once from a Raspberry Pi Pi 3B Plus to a newer version, and this also works like a charm. Um, just do a backup of your actual system by pushing a button, download the file, and import this backup into the new um, system, and everything works again like before. So this is quite nice. But there are also some bad things, or not so good things, um, first of all, sometimes it's a bit hard to find debugging information. Um, I had the problem that I was looking for debugging information, but at the end I found out there was no problem because it was just a broken wire or something. Um, in these cases, it's a bit hard to find some, some errors, but there was no error for sure. That's why it was not working. But it could be better, but I will show you in the workshop some 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 overview about Home Assistant and guide you through the different levels of uh, loggings, and uh, then you maybe will see what I mean. Yeah, the very important uh, thing is that you don't choose a too small SD card. In the beginning, I was using a eight gigabyte SD card and thought it would be enough, but you have historical data that will be saved on a specific uh, time, and depending on number of sensors you have, this can be increased very fast. Um, so don't choose it too small, but yeah, I think 64 or 128 gigabytes should be way more than enough. Um, another point is don't use too slow SD cards. Um, because, or in the past, it was only possible to have uh, everything on an SD card, and if the SD card is too slow, this takes a much of time to boot the system. It's always kind of laggy, but yeah, you know, if you put a very old uh, hard drive into a up-to-date computer, you will get uh, the same for sure. So have a look on the performance of the SD card. I can give you some recommendations later, um, but for now, it's just the hint to take care of the speed of your card. Um, yeah, another thing that disturbs me is that you sometimes have duplicated items. Um, if you're using Bluetooth um, tracking or something like that, um, yeah, over time you get duplicated items, or if you have multiple devices with the same account locked in, you get duplicated items, and it's quite a mess to delete this duplicated item afterwards. Um, yes. So a very, very, very short uh, preview to the workshop that should be started really soon. Uh, if you want to attend um, or to to have you to want to attend, <laughs> uh, I will give you a short overview for the beginning. So we will uh, install some Home Assistant on a Raspberry Pi, or if you want to use VirtualBox, we can also install it in VirtualBox. Um, I will give you an overview about the user interface. We will create some sensors together. Um, we will create some actions. And yeah, I will show you some, some useful hardware like these uh, Node MCUs or these D1 Mini to build your custom sensors. 
for your personal needs. Because the huge problem is that you start a specific point and uh, want to increase over time everything because usually you can't plan everything right now. Or maybe you don't have the money to buy everything right now and you can go step by step and to save some money, it's way more cheap to solder those things by hand. Yeah, and for sure I will show you how to extend the pos possibilities by adding uh, community integrations. You have a lot of integrations already built in, but sometimes you need a bit more, and therefore the community integrations are quite nice. Um, and I will show it to you in the uh, workshop later. Uh, yeah, also we have the, the the ESPs. I will show you how to flash these ESPs quite easy. Um, I will show some, some examples with uh, movement and uh, temperature sensors. Uh, I also have some, some, some relays in my home to, to open and close the garage door or something like that, uh, that can be shown later. And yeah, an interesting tool um, that I would like to show you is the ESP Home thingy because flashing those ESPs is quite easy with ESP Home and also configuration of different um, components is very, very easy. So um, now we can go to the workshop. Um, if you have questions, you can ask these questions in the workshop later. Um, you can go to the Jitsi room at jitsi.cbase.org uh, slash rc3 slash uh, rt3foo <laughs> and the super secure password 23foo42. And yeah, if you would like to start by yourself, you can simply go to the uh, URL on this checkout link, um, Home Assistant IO has IO installation. Um, have a look on the type of installation you want to do. Um, as I told you, you have different possibilities. You can install it as a VM, you can put it on a Raspi, and even for putting it on a Raspi, there are several ways to do this. The most easy way is just to use the um, generic HAS OS um, image, where you have a uh, Home Assistant operating system, and um, everything is installed in inside a Docker, cont Docker container. You can the recipe or something like that. Install it by yourself uh, via Docker or directly install it. Okay. Um, we can see that a lot of people will attend the workshop from Keto. All functionality uh, we, of home assistants. We more... uh, stop our stream now with Teco and Teco have fun with your workshop. Good luck. Toi, toi, toi. Thank you. See you.